What is good, people? We are back once again. Episode 53, Quinny, of the End Product Podcast. Uh, myself, Steve, in the building, and as always, uh, my sparring partner, Quinny. How you doing, mate? Good, Sashi boy. Good good to see you. Congratulations are in order for yourself, first of all. We were just talking before coming on, but uh, a mammoth booking for yourself, Stishy boy. Um, Yes. Glastonbury 23. Very excited. Yeah, Glastonbury's coming for me, uh, getting to play on uh, the Arcadia stage, which for anyone who doesn't know, the Arcadia stage is made out of like scrap metal. Um, and it has like fire breathing cannons that come off the side of it. Looks like a giant spider and you DJ like in the body of the spider with these huge legs. It looks nuts. Um, I got to play on it years ago when it was at festival. So this, they take this stage all over the world. You see it pops up at different festivals. Um, but uh, yeah, they bring like the full beast for Glastonbury. So uh, yeah, absolutely massive stage, thousands of people, big lineup. Um, on the stage tonight I'm playing as well I know uh, Skepta's on after me and a good friend of mine Scream plays later on in the evening so it's going to be a fun fun night my first time at Glastonbury as well so going to be soaking it up all weekend um, we'll probably be a bit worse for wear on the podcast a week after that uh, but yeah very very excited about that and and a gig in Manchester tomorrow as well which uh, is always good at Hidden so buzzing all around in, in the world of music. Uh, what's been going on in your week, Quinny? Um, my week's been, I uh, actually managed to carve myself a wee day off yesterday. Um, I just, I, I, you just need to do these things sometimes, eh? Kids and Definitely, yeah. spring cleaning and da da da, if you can imagine, all this stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting strapped in today and getting stuck into like the weekend game week. So for like, Obviously, all things so related, it's been a bit pandemonium with the collections update that we had, um, you know, and, and everything else this week. So, but I was going to say there, uh, I kind of got thrown off there for a second because I was just thinking your, your gig in Manchester is what's done you because I'll be making my way to Celtic St Mirren on Saturday yeah. and we we're trying to get a wee bit of end product in the house, but unfortunately the, the gig in Manchester is what screwed us, I think, isn't it? Well, yeah, do you know what? It wasn't even the, the gig. When I looked at it a couple of weeks ago, I was like, sweet, I'm halfway there. Um and the you know the trains and buses options were there and flights and all sorts and then when i looked at it after the podcast last week i thought right let me get myself booked in get my trains booked there's um there's strikes on the train line but only north of where i'm going i can get back to london from manchester there's a few delays like a few a few of the usual times are not going but up anywhere north of manchester there's next to no trains. Uh, so it, the only option I had was uh, leaving at about four in the morning from Manchester, but I'm still going to be working at that time. So yeah. it was just impossible to get there unless I drive to Manchester and then to Glasgow. I'm not really one for those long, long journeys. I know you are, Quinny. You've done quite a few of them in, in the car when we've met up in recent months. Yeah. But, uh, I can't do it, especially after a gig. I'd have to be up at like imagine. seven, eight in the morning to get up to Glasgow with enough time to soak up the atmosphere and do it properly. So uh, I think we'll have to park it until another fixture where I can get a flight and just come up straight up for that rather than have a gig the day before. Or so yeah, I am. I'm. I'm a bit gutted about that because you know Celtic's uh, one of the top. It's probably the top of my like two visit list in the UK in terms of football and uh, this was going to be a good opportunity to get there soak up the atmosphere with yourself and some proper Celtic fans as well and uh, yeah I mean, you know I'm fingers crossed we can get it locked in for another fixture um, yeah not many left this season obviously it might it might be next season but yeah a bit gutted about that um, so yeah National Rail that's your fault you've ruined my weekend uh, beyond Friday the rest of my weekend's going to be spent traveling back to London and catching up with the kids football. So yeah, a bit of end product, hopefully uh, in the so rare world and in the, uh, in the real world of, uh, of non-league uh, under nines football in South London. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about us where the dream starts, isn't it? That's it, you know? that's it. We're fully into like trial, trial season right now. All of the clubs have opened up their like sessions for like open trials. So he had a trial last night. I say a trial. He's been training with this team for like a season because last year they thought he was younger than he was. So he's been training with the team. They put him up a year 
this year and he had his trial last night. He's been invited back next week and we've got another couple of trials on the weekend and we're just trying to figure out, you know, as you're in a similar boat with coaching and kids and all that. And it's, it's exciting though. It's nice, you know, getting the kids out into the awesome. football. Um, yeah. Love watching them play. Uh, so yeah, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll know what he's doing next season, whether he's staying put or if we're going to move in more. Yeah. Just lots to figure out, but well. yeah. You're obviously doing uh, the, the Haaland uh, dad agent job, the now Sissy boy, but I think sorry, our scouts and managers from around the world are in the exact same boat, you know, with the, the collections update we had. Um, many cards that were maybe in your club on trial, you're now, um, you know, pulling out the evaluation form on them and saying, are we keeping you for next season or not? <laughs> you know, what do you actually bring to the club now is maybe a question that, um, that we're all asking ourselves when looking at cards of all comers, you know, in all mm. seasons and uh, all sorts of vintages. So I don't think you're alone there, Sissy Boy, and it's probably going to be a big part of what is going to make up end products in general, like in terms of getting high in the leaderboards and dominating. I think is it the 28th of May, so we've got like 10 days before we see this actually land in SO5 or something like that, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that sounds about right. I was listening to um, Laird and Maxim on the Office Hours podcast, which for anyone listening, um, who's trying to catch up with all this news on this sort of collections update. Uh, that was a great insight into not just their thoughts on it, but also what so rare data are building in terms of how you can kind of calculate what that collection score is going to be. Um, does, I don't know about you, Quinny, but the first thing I did was have a little look at my, obviously you've got a lot of Celtic cards, probably a lot of them from the same season as well. Um, I, yeah, this is, so your face tells Ed the whole story there. For those <laughs> listening, Quinny's just kind of done an eat face. Like, uh, yeah, I, that was my exact reaction when I had a little look at my collection, uh, just trying to figure out if, where, if any, I'm going to be sort of like scraping together an extra bit of XP. Um, I think the only one in my head, but I haven't got into the sort of the, the crux of it just yet, but my Joey Veerman card is a Heron Veen, um card from two seasons back. And it's a super rare. And I've also got Pavel Boschnevik super rare from that season. And I also have Jan van Heck super rare from that season. So I don't know how many super rares I need to like boost those cards or how it works. If like all three of them will get a boost or what. But um, yeah, I don't think my gallery is that um, collectible are friendly. Are any of them number ones or first owners? Um, Veerman and... Jan, Jan Van Eck I bought on the secondary, but I think the other two I bought at auction, so I should be first owners on those. You should have 100 points in, which means all three of them will have 2%. I'll take that. I will take that. That would be great, um, especially for a big scoring card like a Veerman. I think that's where that XP is really going to matter, isn't it? So for the if that if I understand then, so from what Maxim and Laird were saying, he figured out that in some of the scarcities may be rare because you only get like 10 points or something like that for each one. You'd need to have almost like 30 cards from that season to get the 5%. Um, yeah. So if you, I've not worked it out if you bought them all from the secondary market, obviously there's only 20 points after 90 days a hit. So it is something mad, but if you buy them all from auction, it's like 18. Right. Right. And, and how many do you need to get 5%? How many points do you need? 750 which is punchy that is what hard to get you get 750 points has anyone done the maths on this well my nyc collection right which is all jersey mints buying there's a few that aren't like some of them didn't get it and i'm missing like four pieces out of that collection i forget the exact number but that rings in at like 960. so your nyc cards should roll in five percent across the board right Oh yeah, uh -huh. that's I'll get that on as soon as it ticks on, and it's the twenty fifth of May. I went and checked it, so as for every NYC card, one issue of each player in that season that I own will get that because of that kind of thing. Wow. But looking you know, at that and thinking, like I've got one special edition in there, which is obviously the Maxi Morales signed card, which now looks like a masterstroke of a, yeah. <laughs> which I only did like three weeks ago, and I did get some pelters for. Um, but I, yeah, anyway, um, but you know how much better could a collection be? And if I did trade them all, you know, how many cards are in this collection? 20. So 20 times, it would, it would lose in theory around 400 points on losing the 90 day hold element. Mm. 
and whatever as well. I'm pretty sure once it still transfers, I would need to work it all out again. But if I was to transfer it on the secondary, the 750 would probably still hold. Um, particularly once the new owners had for 90 days, it would. I think it's almost a certainty. Um, but that it is asking a lot to get to five percent. You know, it is a real, um, it is a real pinnacle. It is a real, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be an easy thing uh, to to get to. But you picking up two percent like that on super rares, I think that's gonna happen at the flip of a switch. Tons of people will have ones and twos everywhere, all over the place. You know, um, and it's about trying to see how far are you away from a three percent or a four percent, and then I see. You know, because you're here in Veen, I would dare say there's a Milan Van Uyck that's in the same I was, season. I was thinking him. He definitely has a super rare that season. I think of the cards that are available from that season squad, he might be one that would still make sense to me to pick up potentially if I need to, if it, if you know, if it gives me an extra percent across the board on XP. Um, it's, I think it's that the big one for me is that that Veerman card um, and how useful that might be for me in. It'll probably be in rare pro next season or in super rare because he's going to age out of U23. So Veerman's going to be challenger rare pro uh, use um, case for me. And depending on where he is, hopefully he stays at PSV another season and, and you know, puts up the same kind of scores as he's been doing. Um, so, yeah, I think I might be tempted to dip into the market if that's going to push another sort of 1%, 2% up. Um but yeah, in terms of the rest of my gallery, there's not a lot in there that are from the same season. I've got quite a few Salzburg cards, but they're in different scarcities, different seasons. So it's like, unless I swap cards with people who need certain uh, seasons, and I think that I've seen a lot of that on Twitter. I think a lot of people have been posting up like they have this season's this, they want that season's that. And it's. Uh, I think that is what we're going to see, you know, in terms of, going out and buying cards i'm not sure if the you know the extra percentage bonus is going to be worth like forking out four three four five hundred quid for a super ref in my in my case but people playing limiteds who knows you know if you've got those cards i think um i mean to mention on air we off air we're talking about mcbride in the group chat who has a couple of busan cards doesn't he and it's like anyone who's got romulo couple yeah. of boots and players who might have the red x might be worth it for that extra bit of percentage um if you can get them at the right price so yeah i haven't really looked into it properly yet to be honest i need to look into it properly but i think i'll probably more likely just wait and see you know when this tooling comes in on so red data that makes it a bit easier to calculate like what i need to like boost and how far away i am from an extra one percent boost or two percent boost and then maybe go out and get what i need but yeah like at a glance, I don't think there's a lot apart from maybe those here and Veen cards that might get me anywhere close to boosting any percentages. But um be really interesting to see how that affects the sort of top end of the tables on that. I first. think I think looking at the one to two percent, I think any cards that you take seriously in your gallery, like people you should be working out what will I get and how do I get to because going from two percent to three percent is such a different um for rares and above. It's mm. such a different proposition, you know, because your Veerman's a first owner, whatever, right? So straight away, you've got 40 points on that. You get the 1% just for that card standing by itself. But then, you know, you've got other cards just by coincidence that are useful. They get you up to the 2% anyway. And putting that kind of collection together for blues or reds isn't really, you know, it's not that much of a pill to swallow mm. to make sure that a card like a Veerman or an important card to you is like get two percent on top and then maybe some other cards that are backups or rotations are cheap or something they're just yeah. they're doing their bit or whatever but going to three percent um for reds and for, for rares and supers it's a totally different undertaking because you need to catch another 150 points and you need to buy a different player from ones you already have you know mm. um so going from two to three percent like it's one of those ones where i've been uh, doing notes and <laughs> working stuff out like mad for um, the couple of days that I had in the year, and even when I was at home, I was working stuff out and sending Pavel all sorts of um, concept offers and stuff like that, and <laughs> just trying to trade French players and, and things. And I've, I've put a little poll out on Twitter, by the way, that we'll bring into the, the podcast shortly. But um, but I think, yeah, any players that anyone is serious about in your gallery, like, oh, I love this guy, or this guy's my important goalkeeper, striker, or whatever, uh, the 1% to 2% you will definitely need to be working out. Because on... 
I think it was my member stream. I went out and I picked up for 11 quid a uh, jersey number Konya Planka from the 1819 Shakhtar season. Because what that did just by buying that, so that's a jersey match. And then once that ticks in within 90 days, that'll be 50 points. And I've already got 40 points on my Trubin. So just by spending that 11 quid, I only need, I could spend like, there's a Shakhtar player out there for a fiver. I could just spend a fiver now. And my mm. Trubin is on 2% now. I've just got him to level 20. It's an OG card and all the rest of it. And then I just know now for the rest of the time that Trubin runs on 12%, if you get me. Um, so that kind yeah. of play, I think, for any... Like, and I say Trubin's not that important to my gallery today, but that was an easy one. It's quite cheap, and it kind of gives you like the sentiment of like Trubin. I'm never going to sell him. You know, I'm waiting for that guy to transfer. I'm waiting for that guy to be somebody, and then he'll be a stalwart player in my club. And for anyone that you kind of see in that way, getting that 1% and 2% clicked on, I think everyone should be looking at Everyone will be looking at um, but once you get to the three, you know, making the decision to go to three percent, it's a it's a different kettle of fish. Absolutely, yeah. I've just had a little look on the market just to see what Hiran Veen cards are out there on the market in Super Rare from that season. And like you're saying, you know, there's a few players there that are still a little bit useful, like uh, Lassa Sean. Um, but you know, he's yeah. quite old. He's probably not got that long left. And you know, the price is like five hundred quid. It's probably not worth it's it. Only twenty points, unless he's a number one. You know what a jersey Oh, number. right. Only 20 points and this is a number one. So there's what one, like there's Sim De Jong, I think. Um, I don't know if he's playing anymore. What's supposed Sim De Jong these days? Let's have a look. So especially Sim in Super Rares, if you're only going to be getting secondary market number fours and number fives and whatever, you know, you're only going to get 20 points per player. So you need another 150 points to go from 2 to 3%. Mm. And for Super Rares, you're talking about the thick end of like seven or eight players probably, you know, which yeah. is that worth an extra 1%? No. You know, um, so it's a totally different uh, proposition going from two to three percent because it's new people you need. You can't just stack up on the good guy that you like. Absolutely, yeah. This is it. I'm I'm just looking now. There's a couple of players there with the red X's, but whether or not, um, you know, the Sim De Jong, he's playing in the uh, second tier of the Dutch league, so I don't think that team's coming up the graph shop. Um, Rodney Congolo, um. Yeah, doesn't seem to even have a club at the moment. Uh, or does he? Hold on. He's. He says he was playing at Cosenza, but he hasn't played in a while. You know, he's, um, his Super Air seems to be held by uh, Pavel. Of course. Uh, he's he's listed, <laughs> at moment, listed at the moment for 95 quid. I mean, if I could get that card down to like 20, 30 quid, I might, might be tempted. Yeah. That Aye, that's tempting. Harry Trades picked up a super rare PK for 20 quid. I saw X. that. It was that's a great move. Pick that's a proper move, you know. Yeah. I mean, even just as a collectible, if the market goes, you know, if it improves over time and the collectible side of it becomes more of a, a thing, as opposed to obviously the collectible side of it here is like still for game players. It's not really, it's not really going to incentivize an NFT collector to just go and collect. This is more like, look, if you play SO5 why don't you get into collecting like think yeah. about that side of things but um yeah i mean pk as a collectible given his investment in the product as well it's quite it's for cool. 20 quid yeah. that is incredible i mean and i think as well like yeah. i think that one of the great things about that example right is because now you've got two cards in the same scarcity in the same season and all the rest of it even when you try so if harry was to sell baldy he would be well advised and so would the buyer to be in direct negotiations and buy the PK with the Baldi mm. because even when they transfer, you'll carry over that 1% that Harry's got on those cards now is transferable. It's not a first owner element, which is important for super rares really, because you're not going to have many special editions and you're not going to have that many Jersey matches either. Um, so you, you forego that for a card you maybe buy on auction. And again, that's maybe a, a trading strategy, a market strategy that will like, we're, we're going to see that over time, you know, uh, the people try and buy the set you've got if you've maybe picked up a few Red X defenders to get yourself. Like I've seen with the Tribune, if I ever was to sell the Tribune, then that Konya Planka being a jersey issue, that does, that's not a first owner. So that's transferable. I can then sell the Konya Planka with the Tribune and anyone else that would then pick it up off of me will then get the 2% I run with. Whereas that first owner part of it is dicey. It's only you that gets that. You can't give that to someone mm. else. So number one's jersey matches, special editions are extra 
spicy now in the market for me because that's a transferable XP element. I've got a number one Osmar Super Rare. Um, I've got a number one Ki Sung Young Super Rare in the same season, Stash. Oh, yeah, we could be doing some business. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, check how much I, I paid for that key before I go and evaluate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a little look now. Yeah, I don't have you. You met your point there on like Jersey Mint Super Rares is a good one because obviously, and unless they're like you know got a low Jersey number, then the Jersey Mints are. I do have a Jersey Mint Super Rare Jesus Ferreira, which oh which tasty, that's tasty. That's a good one. That's good. Uh, oh, and my Jan van Heck is a is a. Uh, so this is good. My super rare Jan Van Eck that pairs with my Joey Veerman is also a jersey match. Ooh, really? Rare. So that could really help in terms of like a bit of a boost. That would, um, yeah. I've got a number one Devive, the number one Kosunu Odilon, um, number one Elias Cabot. Um, I'll send you the link, Stish, right? Uh, and what I'll do is I'll go and look at this poll. I'll see if it's finished, right? But I'll send you the link to the, the maths, okay? Yeah. If you want to actually look at your, see what first owners you are on stuff and whatever. I'm quite interested in this year and one because I think you're carrying your 2% anyway. But like you say, it's known that that bridge, if you're going to cross it, you yes. know, because if you're halfway there, then getting two or two or three supers, I don't think it's an issue to then get 3% because it will be a different, you know, it will make a difference at that level. Mm. But it's known how far over that bridge you already are and, you know, if it's worth crossing kind of idea, you know. I think another thing that's really interesting is if you do have, like you, you mentioned earlier, that Milan Van Uyck as like a good player at Heronveen who you could pick up from that season, um, but also still be able to use him in SO5 in other teams, uh, you know, regardless of just picking him up for the XP. And I think it's be really interesting play for a lot of people to look at, you know, if you've got cards from a few seasons ago that match up, uh, like who else was in the squad that season that might help you that maybe has moved on? That's a that's, it kind of opens a whole new can of worms up that doesn't it? Because I think the Milan Van Oek's a great shout in that I could use him for U23 if I pick up his super rare. He matches up with um, Boschnevich who's still there, um, but also gives me that U23 option, and also at the same time would boost those cards. So. There's, there'll be there'll be certain cards on the market and you know like if you hold those cards and you know that people are out there looking for them you know you hold you hold some like some pretty strong um bargaining power with certain people who need that card that you hold so um that might bring up quite nicely to another point obviously so rare announced in the week that you are now able to uh select that you want to accept if only offers you won't you don't want people offering you cards um i like personally i liked it i went in straight away and i went yeah i just want if only at the moment i get quite a lot of card offers at the minute but they're you know those offers where they'll put like 15 sort of red x cards and a, and 10 quid for like a really decent card i'm like unless i am a pavel I, that that doesn't interest me at all um i i only really swap cards if it betters my gallery you know, like I'd rather swap five of my shit cards for one good one, not really accepting it on the opposite end. Um, so, yeah, the ETH thing was something that I flicked over. But, um, I, again, we, we raised this point. I still think that we really need messaging on site. I don't really like dealing with Discord for, you know, potential trades, swaps, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think in this case with the XP, you know, I am potentially open for trades, but only very specific cards. And so Red Data have been building in some of that, what they're now sort of talking about as ma a potential matchmaking situation on the where you can kind of like put tags on your cards. Like I will accept an yeah. offer over this. And, you know, like once we get to that point where we can say, I'm also looking for this card. If you have this card, we can talk trades. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I know if you followed much of that, but, would you welcome like that kind of uh, functionality on the site or, or even just on server data, like matching with other people who are maybe looking for a card that you have and they might have one that you want. I think that'd be really good. Be good to see yeah. that on the main site as well. It's definitely long overdue. I just thought I would check in on the live chat to see if uh, what everyone else has given it with uh, what we've been going with. And we've had a few B things pop in. Uh, Chani's got a big message. I'm just trying to catch up on it, but I know Chani and yeah, he's, he's actually mentioned it here. He's been open picking up these number ones because yeah, I think he's he spotted that little kind of that nice little wrinkle of the pieces that you probably want to go and pick up in, in this little stage. And Free Tip Scouts caught his life for the first time. Let's go, fist pump. Good to see you. 
uh, and uh, RTG. How is RTG poll going, Tom? I'm not too sure. I'll be checking that later. And JC's talking about buying Celtic cards, which, and again, similar to what you were just chatting about there, I've been looking at as well, is like what seasons, what scarcities, et cetera, et cetera. And like what we've been kind of chatting about so far is working out, you know, um, if you look at that graphic, I just keep thinking of it as a bridge because it is like the way they've laid it out. It's kind of like bridges and checkpoints almost, you know, so that's just the way it is in, in my head. And I'm just trying to look at all. So one thing, I, I, I let me throw this at you, Stish, right? What I've worked out <clears throat> is I have currently three first owner, um, same season, same scarcity, uh, RB Leipzig cards. And one of them's a rookie. And we believe rookie cards are now uh, special edition qualifying. Okay. So that's been That's been cleared up. So they rock in on 2% straight away. And that's Guardiola, Angelino, and a wee guy called Ray Bigger, who doesn't play, but he's a rookie. Um, so I'm looking at that, right? And I'm thinking, how can I make this work for me or benefit me or whatever? And um, one of the solutions I came up with and kind of some of my concepts and my notes and whatever is, okay, I need probably a bit more of a, I need a better midfielder maybe, for example, let's say. And um, you kind of brought this point up already, I suppose, in, in a way. But I need an R midfielder for Europe next year. Right, okay, well, who was in the Leipzig squad that season mm. that for me buying any rare of that season, doesn't matter what number it is, because of the guys I've already got, he will just walk into my club and be on 2% bonus on top of me getting them hopefully up to 10% as quick as possible. Mm. Um, and then when I look at that year, there are some good options you could talk about. Sobislai, Danny Olmo, and Kunku is a midfielder that season. Obviously, he's going to Chelsea, but so that's probably not going to work out that great. Um, but... Like how easily, for example, like your 20, uh, not your 20, your here and Veen thing come in. I had a thing like that. I'd even think about, I, would, I would probably sold most of those guys. I've had to really think about it to maybe enhance another collection somewhere. But when I actually broke it down and worked it all out, it's like, Jesus, man, those three guys are already uh, kind of sitting there. Um, and I think they're going to, I think, you you know, the, for some of the people that or the majority of people that probably listen to this podcast, because of how eclectic a lot of the galleries we have are, mm. you know, there will be some really fascinating and some really interesting like stacks and duets, if you know what I mean, of ma- mismatched teams because you've got them on 13% or something or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is the, so that uh, the medium post you just sent over. So I'm just reading it now and I'm trying to figure out. So the as I understand from reading this, and you might be able to um, clear that up, but the the points are the same across all scarcities. So whether it's limited or rare or super rare, you get 10 points as opposed to like times 10 or anything like yeah. that. So, yeah, so I guess looking just like at, at a glance, was it? Yeah, I guess. So max one owner is 20 points. Number one serial, 30 points. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. I think maybe I can get to that kind of 100 points the 250 might be a little bit of a stretch in Super Rare for me, but, you know, I I might be able to get to that 2% on some of these cards, given that, you know, I think I've got the number one Van Eck. I've got, sorry, I've got the jersey number Van Eck, and I think I have, I think my Veermans are number three. Um, yeah, I don't have the number ones of either of, any of the others so it might be a bit of a struggle for me to get there unless i can pick up another number one or something like that and then yeah but i'll be interested to see um it could see me dip into the market for something unexpectedly because i think for the last few weeks i haven't seen anything on the market that's made me think i need that it's more like do i want it like if i'm buying at the moment it's more like oh i wouldn't mind one of them in the collection in the gallery um i think my gallery is in the best place it's ever been obviously i've had quite i've had three tier zero wins in the last couple of months so beautiful I keep winning goalkeepers i've got too many goalkeepers which is never a bad thing but i think that some of what i need you know with the amount of goalies i've got unfortunately i don't have that many of the goalies that hit those midweeks um i think i probably need to swap some of them out for an mls keeper so i've got like that option um, a lot of the goalies i've got are sort of south american I don't have a rare MLS option that starts at the moment. So I might have to try and consolidate some of those recent wins into maybe an MLS keeper instead of like, I won another keeper this week, uh, under 23 goalkeeper, um, Stankovic, who's on loan from Inter at Volendam. So a good win, maybe a few weeks back, but right now 
probably not so great. You know, yeah, we don't know what he's doing next season. So, uh, yeah, I'm um, gallery's in a great place. It's just a problem. I don't think this is the greatest time to be trading, is it? Like when you've got European cards. So I might be sitting tight on some of those cards in hope that prices pick up a bit as we get closer to the start of a new season. Um, Lunique SR in the chat has said that they managed to pick up a Jersey Mint Busan player from Pavel for £3 to get the Romulo to 2%. Um, they said, I know that my Rom that Stish's Romulo is the one of 100, but do you have any more Busan players at the moment? Um, no, I don't. Um, not at the moment. So I, I I might I might pick some up um, potentially just to help squeeze that Romulo up. If he keeps putting the scores up that he's doing, you know that that those extra percentages will pro possibly make the difference. So definitely uh, Busan is worth a look because I think a lot of their players are red crosses as well. So I think you know Pavel's probably a bit wise to this as well though. He's definitely not letting rid of rid of those uh, red crosses number ones now that cheaply. Um, but yeah, Lunique, he's definitely um, negotiating a bit different. A but what, one thing, I, what, one thing I was going to say on that uh, jersey mint uh, kind of part of it as well is like one of the things because we were talking about how hard it is to boost these things up, right? The, what we're going to see next season, right, is the OP move, particularly at super rares, is going to be number one jersey goalkeepers. So any goalkeepers that are number one jersey, you buy that from auction, it's a hundred mm. points clean straight away just for the goalkeeper. So mm. you would buy the goalkeeper on auction and clean in 2% on Super Rare. So then any other, that season, that team cards, you then go forth with, you know, you're already, you yeah. know, right ahead of the pack, you know. So that'll be a that'll be an interesting market development we see. But the, the other thing I wanted, it's just the only reason I stepped on your toes here, Stashi, sorry. But uh, when I pulled Chani's comment apart and actually read over it properly, uh, Chani's talking about the kind of tertiary players, kind of the Red X guys that we we're kind of chatting about and how, you know, if you can get enough of them cheap enough, you know, you can boost them in behind a talisman like a Verbruggen or whatever, who's a number one, and uh, and get their XP up. And equally then, depending on the quality of the guys, and I'm kind of kind of thinking about this without thinking about it with my NYC and my Celtic guys, but those guys become very useful potentially for cap mode options, just having fillers. And I'm, I'm even thinking of my Celtic cards, particularly the ones that come off the bench all the time, because that could just be like a permanent 220 outfit and you're just rolling that out, and you're just waiting for the time that it comes in or whatever. So it's not all just buying the guy to sit in training and boost XP on somebody else, but with the amount of gameplay that is available, you know, some of these other plays, if you pick the right guys, you know, they might actually pay off um, for an entry somewhere by themselves. Definitely. Do we, next season, I know, like, obviously at the moment, a lot of those kind of Russian cards and some of the Italian teams that didn't renew their licenses last season, are they all losing that like extra bonus next year? Yes. So those Russian cards won't be quite as OP next season, right? Yeah, but there will be other people that have that thing going on. It's happened before. Oh, yeah. It'll happen again with somebody. So it's working out who's uh, <laughs> who's going to be the next big Mama Jama fifteen percent cards that will now be twenty percent cards potentially for somebody. You know? Yeah, I've got my. I think my Igor Deviv at the moment has about three fixtures left at one hundred and thirty-three percent. So it's like. 33% on him, you know, on the right game week can be massive. Um, but yeah, it's it's all about that XP, man. Like it, it, You notice it at the end of the game weeks now, don't you? Um, just how much of a difference it makes. You know, the the difference between first and fifth place is normally like a matter, you know, could be like five points, could be two and a half points. So um as the supply goes up, you know, the availability of these cards becomes more and more easy to obtain, like the ones that you need. Those percentages are going to come in massively. So I'm going to be really intrigued to see how those uh, game weeks roll out. What is it? This time next week, we'll, we'll see the first yes, results. So we'll have a rough idea of like, you know, what if what a difference it's making to certain people's galleries. I think that there's definitely a few sort of accounts that spring to mind when you think of galleries that are heavy, you know, like obviously YNWA is very much Liverpool has a lot of the cards from the early seasons there. So he's already got probably max XP on most of those cards and is probably going to add four or five percent to all of them. Um, so we'll all be praying that Liverpool go back to being pants. Um, <laughs> they've had a bit of a run, haven't they, of late? Um I'll be obviously hoping that they don't continue this run as well as a United fan. 
things are getting into the business end of the seasons this next couple of weeks and we're going to start finding out who's going to have that midweek utility next season quinny any uh any eyes on any particular clubs we were speaking a few weeks ago um about potential like little stacks you know like who's who's next season's villa stack etc got your eye on any clubs and their position in the league tables at the moment and what might be a decent pickup for next season well i think I don't know, 20 were a bit different, right? Because 20 coming into the season, uh, early season, were tipped because they had like favourable Conference League qualifiers and Diddy games like that. I forget the exact situation of it. And they kind of faded away over a wee part of the season and then obviously post-World Cup, they came back with a bang. Um, but sometimes the teams that, I don't know, on paper, you maybe think are better for that um, option. Like Villa, for example, second half of the season, just play weekends. Don't play midweeks ever, you know. Obviously, they had a bit of a manager problem early season. It wasn't until their current manager came in that they got the form that they've currently got. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Yeah, I kind of so that that's where I'm still kind of chopping and changing. I don't really know where to be looking yet because midweek utility is great. And then for the 20 situation, even if you're going to get two bites of the apple, say through the season, if one of those bites is early doors when you're beating teams six nil in qualifiers or in a diddy group or whatever. Mm. Um then that can be good. But again, it's, it's, it depends on, you know, then it's, it's having a full team ready for midweeks. Is that the team, you're going to get a full team of them or is it just, you know, are you building a defence out of a team or an attack or or whatever? Um, so I'm still kind of at that point of, let's see where everyone finishes up in terms of the qualification spots for Europe next season because a lot of these challenger Euro teams, especially if you've got a really good one that's not in Europe, that could be great, you know, because they're just playing weekends and just horsing somebody. Um, from the bottom end of Austria or Belgium or Croatia or whatever it might be. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm still undecided for the actual, you know, where to start part, <laughs> to be quite honest. What about yourself? Yeah, like, do you know what? I've, I've been thinking about looking at it for the past couple of weeks, but I just haven't got down to, let me sit down and have an actual look at, you know, like what and where and how. And um, yeah, I'm just having a little look at the Eredivisie. I think Eredivisie... You know, I think this is why people were looking at Tevente last season um, and just looking at the teams that are in and amongst the kind of European positions at the moment. And obviously, Feyenoord have won the division now. And then it, you've got PSV, Ajax and Alkmaar in the kind of European positions. So it'd be really interesting to see where Ajax finish. If Alkmaar can get ahead of them, that will put Ajax in fourth place, which would put them right in the Conference League. I mean, yeah. wow, that would be tasty, wouldn't it? It would be. I've, I've got quite a few IX players already, so I'd probably be looking at filling a few gaps in there. Um, Alkmaar as well, you know, I did. they did pretty well in Europe this season, didn't they? If they can get in there again, I'm sure that they will be uh, of interest to a lot of people. Last season, I think it was big on the U23s, but I think most of their big U23 plays are aging out this summer. So I'm not sure that they'll have that kind of weight. And I think that's another talking point, isn't it? Who are going to be the U23 stars for next season? A lot of big cards are aging out this summer. Um, definitely a lot in my gallery, particularly. Um, Quinny, are you much of a U23 player yourself? Are you going to be looking to try and pick up some of the potential wonder kids of next season? And, and like, do you have any thoughts on who those might be as well? Um, well, I, I think I'm going to be reluctantly playing under 23 next season because I do think, I, I think Trubin will get a transfer and I think I'll have him playing and, you know, maybe he plays All-Star or whatever, but I should have uh, options to play U23 again because I've not really had that uh, since getting rid of like Beza and uh, I can't remember who my other Europeans were, like Vandervoort, of course, I need Vandervoort back in my life. Um, mm. But I think, I'll, um, yeah, so I think I uninvertedly will be and a guy that I'm actually really wrestling with um I kind of want to sell him because I think he should be going for way more than what he is. And then let me just check his super rare price before. Yeah, he's not even listed, but super rares will be hard to get because he is U23 still. He should be U23 for a while. He is. Super rare didn't, his super rare went quite cheap that recently, but not an absolute bargain. Uh, and again, people who watch my stuff will probably know the name before I say it, but it's Felix in America. Yeah, he's got an L5 and now a 65. His AA is brilliant. And just when he gets, if he gets a decisive, he brings in AA or above. Very similar to Eberichiese. Not only in the SO5 style, but actual gameplay style. Big, commanding, centre mid, goes all over the pitch, wins the stuff, intercepts, tackles, passes, goes all over the place. Really exciting. Uh, he's nationalised for Germany now. 
Um, and I think uh, Azeze even. Um, and I, I really like. Oh, by the way, Palace might be a shout for yes. um, for being a Villa team next year because I think Eze and Olise, um and there's another one, uh, Eze, Olise, and I think Zaha's off next season. I don't think he'll be there, but I don't think I saw much of a problem. But to be honest with you, no, Eze is not your 23 anymore. Tyrek Mitchell, Mitchell I like got Gehi yeah. at the back as well. Gehi will be a good scorer next season, I think. Yeah, we'll figure out so who the goalkeeper is going to be because I think uh, it's a bit of a coin toss at the moment between um, Gaeta getting back in and Johnston keeping the uh, number one. So be interested to see how they line up those first few games of the season. Um, so I, I think the make out is is twenty four at the moment, so that, that's uh, a moot point. But I think Oli says you twenty three for the remainder of this season, maybe not next year, but. Uh, Nemeka kind of stands out like that kind of guy on SO5 terms. And I don't know, I'm still kind of scratching around. There's a few people I'm watching out for, see what loans they get and stuff like that. Because, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of transfers that really could change a lot of U23s. Like, for example, the first person I'm thinking of, like who could wildly change their position, could be somebody. And again, I'm not up on his situation at the moment, but could be somebody like Noah Lang. Like, you know, who's been absolutely bombed out. But if he went down a level, because it doesn't feel like anyone's coming for him, right? So yeah. if he, like, takes a sideways or downward move, as long as he doesn't turn into a fucking brat, you know, maybe <laughs> he... And I don't even know if he's still U23 next year, you know? But, like, there's so many potential moving parts. I don't think we're going to... You know, we're not really going into next season knowing about Mbappes and, uh, you know, these types of guys the same way as we have done in previous seasons. I think the jury's still out in that respect, but... The it's last part of this season will be where you kind of see guys that are getting blooded into a team and you see, oh, you know, like the new manager or blah, 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 you know, whatever. So that's one that, again, the Mecca's mad cheap. I wish he was way more expensive so I could sell him because I think he's doing quality than who, but he's not. Yeah, just having a little look at Noah Lang. It's a good shout that he's a, he's actually picked up, his scoring's picked up in the last few games. But like you said, he's had a bit of a bit of a bum of a season until like literally like he's hit a, a hundred, a couple of games back and, you know, his, his L5 is up now, but I'd agree. I think his, he uh, definitely underwhelmed a bit this season, didn't he? But if he could take, you know, like a, like you said, a sideways move, like maybe a move into the Eredivisie, uh, you know, playing for a PSV or a Feyenoord or something like that, he could absolutely clean up there. Um, so he is a good shout. I was having a little look at my gallery and what is going to be available to me in U23 next season. And one of the interesting ones for me was... a. Uh, Conan Jocelyn Endry, who plays at Eupen or Erpen or whoever, whatever they're called. Uh, he's been linked to Lille. Um, if Jonathan Bamba expectedly leaves this summer, apparently Lille are looking at Endry as a potential replacement. And I picked him up about this time last year, a tip off of one of my friends who had seen him playing um, in the off season, said, oh, this guy looks really good. He's rapid, good with his feet, very, you know, pacey. Um, so bought, I picked up a rare and a super rare of his, and he's been pretty good, like for Urpen towards the end of the season. Um, he has registered seven goals and five assists in the, in, in the league this season at a pretty poor team. Um, yeah. but has been one of those players that, you know, if you look at so rare data, um, and you're kind of trying to crunch numbers on like what might be a good game week for him. He almost always hits what is expected of him. You know, if so red data says he's playing against a team that, you know, a right forward is likely to score 60 plus. He normally does because he's picking up the scores as expected on dribbles, one jewels, one, all that kind of stuff that work really work out really nicely for forwards. Um, you know, shots on target, attempted assists. He's got all of that in his repertoire. Um, but yeah, to the eye, for those who've watched him, very quick, very pacey, good with his feet. And as someone who did actually get to see Lille in the flesh this season against PSG, I feel like his style of play, will he'll slot straight into that front three that they like to play up there. Um, good attacking football, fast on the counter. He ticks all those boxes. So I think if he did move to Lille, that would be a really interesting move and if he did find himself in that starting 11, I would, I like that. But I do think that he needs that move. If he stays at Erpen, he's going to be another one of those. that's like, yeah, it's all right. But, you know, I expect them to be there or thereabouts the kind of relegation dogfight again next season. Yeah. So he he's an interesting one. Um, in looking in my gallery again, and just like what is there 
U23. I don't think I have any of those sort of potential bangers for next season. I think Jesus Ferreira could potentially move from Dallas in the summer, um, as could a lot, you know, like MLS, they like to get rid of the the big the big players, don't they? He could end up in German Division 2 or something somewhere. So I'm not sure what comes of him. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't hold a great deal of um, exciting talent for next season in terms of U23. So I think I am going to need to dip in if I'm looking to play that. But I do think a lot of my big cards, the reason that I am doing well in U23 this season are because of, you know, Vim and uh, Daviv, uh players like that, that I'm going to lose to, you You know, they're going to lose that utility. So I'm not even sure how seriously I'll be looking at U23. I think it's hard until, I think if so Red Data are listening to this, please just put in a button that's like ages out this summer so that I can just look at what I've got in a couple of months. It's really hard to go in individually and be like, right, that guy's no good. This guy's no good. One of those little buttons is like, you know, we've got the U23. Um, the death button. Yeah. <laughs> can we get a button that's like the kill switch? The kill yeah. Switch. Just like eradicate <laughs> anyone who ages out this summer, just so I can have a little look at what I've got for U23 and whether or not I need to buy or just like not not focus on it for next season, really. But, um, so yeah. It's an expensive division to do half in, half out, isn't it? You know, Absolutely. which is why I was kind of mentioning earlier. It's like reluctant. I think I'll just about have enough to, yeah, let's go for it. You know, with uh, some of the guys I've got lying around. But um, I've yeah. seen I'm seeing some really good stuff coming in the chat dish from people talking about uh, potential Chani uh, Chani again coming in talking in about this, the, the the stacking element of all this, like the the midweek XP bonus as well and all the rest of it, it might be super overkill, could be mad OP. Simon was telling us a Palace stack won Prem Pro this week. Mm. And Brez is asking a question that I really, this is one I wanted to get to. Uh, you reckon European, European based players will drop 25% more when the season finishes or more? Sorry. Um, it's so hard to call that, isn't it? I think because I don't think it's possible even to like go on what last season's data will look like. You can only kind of like guess. I think like the general vibe at the moment is that I'm still expecting prices to come down a little bit. I don't know about you, Quinny, but I feel like they could come down. Um, it's hard to be sure. Um, I think I think a lot of it will depend on how many new users come in and, and you know, not just new users, but you know, paying paying players, not just free to play. So I think um, maybe we do see the prices drop a little bit more. But if, you know, they absolutely nail it with the marketing in the lead up to the big European season starting and we see a big influx of paying players, pay to play rather than free to play, then we might see those card prices, um, you know, spike back to maybe not where they were this time last season. I think, you know, we've got a lot, a lot more supply. The, the user base hasn't grown at the same rate that they might have hoped, that we all might have hoped. But um yeah, a lot kind of rests on how many new um, paying players join, I think, over the summer. But I do feel like, um, you know, they're, they're doing their best to kind of like allow people to have a go and come and have a go. And, you know, it, I feel like it's a quite attractive, um, what's the word? It's a bit of an, it, it, it looks attractive to people that want to come in, maybe spend 50 to 100 quid pick up a few limiteds or rares and have an actual go at winning the threshold. I think that's why right now, the way I look at it, I think it is getting harder and harder for people to come in and win cards because you need the big cards. You need the players to hit. You need to, you need the predictability of like a big score a bit. If you're going to like hit the cards and hit well in the cards. But if, as long as the thresholds are around, I think it's an attractive proposition for people to come in with, a few hundred quid buy maybe five to 10 cards and try and compete for thresholds. So as long as we've got those at the current price, you know, floor of a lot of the cards, I think the barrier to entry is uh, quite attractive in terms of your potential to like win your money back at the moment. And let's be honest, like anyone who's spending money to get into what they see as a game is going to be looking at what's my potential ROI um, as much as, you know, we can compare it all day long to like, oh yeah, but people spend all this money on FIFA cards. I don't, I don't think we can really compare it in that sense to FIFA. Um, you know, kids play FIFA and they don't have any concept of like 
ROI or they don't care. They just want to make sure they've got the players that they want to play with. People who come into so rare adults, they think differently about money and they will see this as, you know, it might, they might see this the same way as like, would I put a 50 quid bet on this in terms of what, what, what am I winning back if I, if that hits? And I think there is that, that so rare is still like, all right, technically not gambling, but I do think that that the people that play it will sit, will look at it as like, how much can I win? Or like, how much do I have to put in to win X amount? And, and I think that the, the current price of the cards is in a good place that it looks attractive. So I would expect, hopefully, if the market in absolutely nails it over the off season and it get and we get a nice influx of paying customers, then I expect maybe a little drop when all the seasons are actually completely finished for a few weeks where people start flipping into MLS and Asia and whatnot. Um, and then maybe we might see it pick back up for like maybe the beginning of August, end of July. Um, what do you reckon, Quinny? It's hard to call it, I think, at the moment. The timing of it all is so impossible, you know. Um, but I think it's a, it's an interesting thought. I never thought about the potential uh, dip off because I think where the dip off kind of ties into is like as soon as the old season is gone, first owner status is is gone. You know, you cannot be a first owner on any of those cards now that you're from that point forward going to go and get. Um, so it basically then means for everything. It, it could, be, and I don't know if Brez, I'm, I'm on the wrong path here, but that was just where my mind went. It's like anything that then at that point isn't a one, a jersey or something. Maybe it's a bit more volatile to to to, to dip and down an extra kick or two because that guy had, you know, like three or four special editions over the season, whether it be a number one and a, a jersey and then a, maybe a champion edition or something. I don't know, just giving an example, but. Um, I don't think that, like, so, I did, so the Twitter poll I did is, is finished up, right? And I asked everyone out there, um, how much of an impact has the new updates had on your strategy slash collection, right? Uh, and I'll ask you, Stish, what, I'll, I'll give you the four options, right? And then I'll tell you the results, right? So zilch or zero, um, moving fringe players, moving core players, full reboot. I would say at the moment, mine is probably zilch, but... I don't expect it to stay at that. I think I'm just waiting. I, I need the tools. I, I'm, a, I'm one of those people that like, I think like I said, I had like a very brief look at like, what does my gallery look like? And barring that here in Veen, uh, there's nothing that sticks out as like, oh, you're close with that. So I think once we, um, once we get past, once we get the tools on Surya data, probably, then I'll probably go in there and be like, right, analyze my gallery. What, what do I need? How many points away from a percentage am I? So I'd expect maybe at the moment it's probably like zilch beyond like just having a little brief look at the gallery, but maybe like ask me in a month and I might have brought a card or two in depending on like what, how available they are and what kind of prices. Cause yeah, yeah I think, I think I'd pay maybe up to about 50 quid for an extra percentage. Anything over that would feel a bit like maybe I'm overpaying for it. But if some of the players who are like important players in my gallery are close to that, I'd expect in the next month, if the right cards are available to push me over that threshold, then I'll probably pick them up. But, uh, but yeah, I would say that. What was the, uh, what was the final kind of uh, out, outlook on that? 60% are with you on Zilch, 30% moving fringe players, under 4% moving core players, and just under 6% on a full reboot. A full, so there there are people thinking of a full reboot though. Yeah, and I think like if, uh, I'm going to suspect if you've got a very messy Celtic collection, that might be the the five percent because you've got players from Japan and yes. you know Korea and Russia and everything else you know in between. So different seasons of cards as well. So um, if you've got a gallery like that and you are like quite one club focused, maybe you do kind of consolidate around. I personally like I've kind of mentioned throughout the show already, but like I'm kind of mainly moving fringe players. And then it's more of like, you know, like I said with the Leipzig example, it's like, oh, by the way, is there a core player I could get that actually would just cheat code their way into my team somehow by virtue of me having whatever else I have in the uh, in the club? So, um, I'm, I'm, you know, you're with the majority, and I'm with the the number two there in terms of just moving some French players because I planned anyway. See, before this came out, I was planning stish on trading my Vissel Kobe Kyogo and my Yokohama Maeda because. 
Neither of them are special to me, really, in any way, shape, or form at all. They were just the first ones I could get when they first signed. Mm. And, you know, obviously, first season comes out, the ones with hoops on them are always going to be a bit punchier because everyone wants them in hoops. And now they're in a second season. So I thought, brilliant, we'll go into this off season and I'll just swap them out and I'll get a nice looking. And it's mainly for social media and stuff. So when I'm tweeting stuff out, they're all wearing hoops and they all yeah, yeah. and it looks a bit nicer on posts and stuff. Um, so obviously when this update, that's the only kind of some of this stuff I was going to be doing anyway because it kind of fits in with, with my strategy or whatever. But I will be, I, and I don't know if I'd consider Maeda and Kyogo and some of those guys like fringe players, but I'll, I'm also trying to do a wee bit of that. Check up the Celtic ones. Like a few, just a few wee face changes, you know, just swap me a kit or something, you know. Something you just said then has triggered like a little like, like thought in my head, and I, I would love to pick your brain on this. Um, so you just mentioned like you know your social media, putting it out there with the hoops on. Obviously, you do Celtic content as well as so rare content, and then you have your content that kind of meshes the two together, which which I find really interesting because I think from what we can see sort of publicly about. And from, you know, from our own experiences of our interactions with so rare as a business as well, um, a lot of the marketing is quite dependent on uh, third parties at the moment in terms of, you know, people like us deciding we want to put a podcast out about it or, you know, content creators on YouTube who love playing the game and are quite happy to create a new channel just dedicated to so rare content or talk about it to maybe their FIFA followings. I know Chani's in the chat be good if you're still here to hear your input on this as well actually but at the moment it is quite um the case that anyone who does want to kind of engage in a little bit of content creation social media etc built around so rare we kind of have to figure it out on our own and then you know once we've built it up we can maybe we've got a bit of clout then we can reach out to her and be like hey like any chance we can get some get get a hand here whatever do you think that Firstly, is, is is this working? Do you think it's enough that like they rely on, you know, like outsiders to kind of build the content and stuff? But also I've heard other sort of like streamers and probably like people who play FIFA a lot and people who watch FIFA content talk about how 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 like boring, if you like, it is to like stream about so rare to people who are used to watching maybe FIFA gameplay, that kind of thing. What can what can be done? To make this more like streamer friendly or, or or do you even think that 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 matters should should so be looking elsewhere at reaching a new target audience like what can be done how can we all do our bit i guess in terms of like getting this to the masses ahead of next season i would say and this is mainly my experience as a father at this point um kind of chiming in right but i think in terms of like gamifying it but it is like you know uh, you know because all that kind of content it's it's buzz it's a thrill you know like so when i think about fifa pack openings and or watching people play fifa i can think about other videos that are like that you know like you know for example being a father anyone who's got kids will know this one of the first videos your kids will find on the internet is people opening up kinder eggs yes yeah, it's one of the first videos that every kid sees <laughs> so true um, it's exactly the same um, one, yeah <laughs> yeah and uh so there's something in that now are we ever going to have that kind of pack opening thing or unboxing that you know i do it with toys i watch people get something new unbox it they show you what it's made of and how it you know there's lots of stuff out there that's like that can they do anything like that outside of us doing uh reward openings which we do already or auction watches which are kind of boring unless it's yeah. a marquee card where six figures get splashed right it's kind of hard to do something that's existing in the game and then the second thing is that head-to-head -head element where it's me and you playing FIFA or it's me and you playing Mortal Kombat or it's me and you playing fucking Snakes and Ladders. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Anything. And there's that competitive element. It's dish. If you lose, you're going to get a pie in the face. And if I lose, <laughs> I'm going to eat a shoe or whatever. I don't know. And um, whatever people do. I don't know. This is Glasgow. Anything goes up here. <laughs> it's it so rare. How can you do that? Because you can't just get... Right, okay, let's get Celtic out on the pitch to now, make them go play a game of football. So I can play my five cards against your five cards, Stish, and we'll mm. do a head-to-head. -head. So for any of those, like, gamifiable parts, you need to, something new needs to be injected into it, or something new needs to be, like, forged in, yeah. in the game itself. Because, there's, you know, it's real-time, it's real-world football. And if you want to 
if you want to to have one, you know, one of those two main, just in my, I say it's just me as a dad, you know, when I see kids, it's always one of those two things. It's either, let me show you how to play Minecraft and build a house and let me show you this mod that I've done and let me show you, you know, all that. it's just let me show you or let me play head to head who can build the biggest house or who can beat each other at whatever the game is. And um, because so there is just on real time, like there's very little real time things you can, you, know, you can just turn it's the camera true. on and, and go at. It's like a four day long game as well, isn't it? Really? Like, yeah, the game starts when the game week opens and it ends when it ends. So it's like, you know, we no one no one who plays FIFA online sits and plays a 90 minute match, do they? They they will sit and play like a four or five minute match and people will sit and consume that and watch it and engage with it. But the only thing I've thought that like maybe is missing from the content sphere is the only thing that could potentially harness a bit of interest from maybe outside of the so rare you know like we have soccer saturday or you know like football focus whatever yeah the live scores on match day like like soccer saturday then what the only thing that i think is potentially missing is is you could do that you know like on the sunday night or you know probably on the the close of the week game week like the last couple of fixtures obviously there's a problem with not being able to show any football clips or highlights unless yeah unless somehow Sora manages to wrangle the kind of rights to that. That's, that's got to be cool. If we can get to that point where like you can flash up a clip of the, the FC Saul goal going in as it goes in, I think, you know, like on, so as someone who streams on Twitch, obviously we're streaming on Twitch. Now you can use <clears throat> overlays and stuff like that, that are like interactive. I think that one thing that could be nice potentially is uh, some kind of like Twitch uh, widget overlay that links up to your so rare account so it can see what cards you got in your gallery. And then I can set it as an overlay on say like this on our end product podcast. Whereas like while we're live, if like one of my players scores a goal, it pings up like, you know, a notification pings up on the bottom of the screen, like Ooh. Osmar assist like 60 minutes. And then it kind of like live. Tra also you can like add like live tracking of like your leaderboard position. So you can kind of like count down the end of your game week. That might be something cool that isn't being done at the moment. But then how many people are going to watch that? But also, how attractive is that to people who aren't already en engrossed in the so rare content sphere? And I think that that is half the problem at the minute is that, that we hit that ceiling, don't we? There's only like this. I think we talk about it on this podcast is like there might only be like eight to ten thousand people in the world who consume so rare content from somewhere every week. And it's like until until like so rare starts creeping into normal people's you know experience of the game of football or of betting on football or of playing fifa or whatever it is um and i think up to this point obviously a lot of the big content creators are like more sort of fifa based which is obviously a much younger demographic you talk about kids opening kinder eggs my son watches football content and he does get fed so rare content probably because i look at it as well right but also because he knows what it is he doesn't play it but he, he's in he's he's invested in like what how i'm getting on in the game week right but he can't actually go and then set up his own account and fund it and buy cards and play he knows how to play the game but he cannot he's not able to how do we reach people who can and i think someone's touched on this before it's like Obviously, there's that kind of the problem where so rare had to make distance itself as like a gambling product. But let's be honest here. The gambling market, the football gambling market is absolutely the market that needs to see this product and will get it and will probably love it. Because for me, you know, I've never been a big gambler, but I very rarely put a bet on now because so rare scratches that itch. I don't really need to put an accumulator on because I've got way more interest in more games then I would have put in like a six fold on or something like that. Right. I think, how do we reach that market? And are we, is the product justified enough in the fact that this is not gambling, but accepting of the fact that we need gamblers to see this product and they need to interact with it and they'll get it. Have, has enough time passed beyond like the whole, the fundraising, all of that, you know, the people who've invested their money into this now, do you think some of them might turn around and be like, Let's go get that bet three six five market. Let's go, you know. Let's, let's tap go into that. that bet let's go get that money. <laughs> let's go and get that money exactly. And I think that if we can tap into that without 
you know, without like hitting ourselves with all the legislation that comes with it. Because I think like the legislation for British doesn't matter as much. Like if we are considered a gambling product, it won't really affect us as much as like it might stop people from putting a certain amount of money at one time into it. But in some countries, it would completely... I think in the UK, if it's decided yeah. to be gambling, it's an absolute godsend. Because I don't think he, I don't think there's any gains as far as I'm... As far as I'm yeah, I think it's more like, you know, like <laughs> in certain countries where gambling, online gambling is banned, like big lots of parts of America, sure. yeah, um, yeah. you know, obviously we lose a massive... It's more of a taxation of and a regulation thing here rather than... Yeah. Uh, in other countries it's more about prohibiting and it's against the law to do it and it's all that kind of stuff yeah i'm with you yeah it's not as big a deal here perhaps in that sense um, yeah, people in the chat are agreeing as well that the uh you know the gam getting at that kind of gambling lot I, we've, gone, we've gone the fpl route we've gone the fifa route and it's like but i think we've got those we, i mean that we can definitely get more fpl players on for next season i think but Simon's come up with a belter. Jeff Sterling is available at the end of the season. Imagine, yeah. <laughs> imagine so rare hire Jeff Sterling and we did a so rare, so rare Saturday or whatever. Mate, so rare Saturday. If, if you're listening, in, so rare. Honestly, throw some money at that. Get Jeff Sterling in and get the overlay. Get the like, oh, like Sassinia goal, like flashes up. Like we don't, we don't just need the Prem and the Championship and the uh, like top European leagues. We need, we need those Sassinia live decisives coming in from Jeff Sterling. Yeah, I was going to say, but maybe maybe Jeff isn't the maybe Jeff isn't the move, but because if you're going to do this for the first time, you want a Jeff Sterling, but knows like Belgian stuff, like the way he knows yeah. League One stuff, you know, and they know Croatia the way he knows League Two and stuff like that, and then they could go, oh, that's so and so, that's his forty fourth goal against them, and oh, you know, and <laughs> we need that Euro footy guy off of uh, off of TikTok who does all the like videos on the Wonder Kids and that. Don't you follow him? But he's a uh... but the wee kid with glasses. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just get the impression he might just do his research ahead of his videos, but he seems, you know, he seems pretty. I know he's a good guy, in that. But I don't think he's a Jeff Sterling of uh, European football. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no, no one is really. Let's be honest. Jeff Sterling is Jeff, isn't he? Legend. Yeah, indeed. Uh, but yeah, so rare Saturday would be great uh, for anyone that has the time to put into like a like six hour long live stream with all the live scores flashing up and the decisives coming in and your team getting tracked in the top corner and maybe, you know, like you go up against another manager and they're featured on the weekend. Like there's, I mean, that's a build in. That's, that's, I think is a JavaScript application. Most of these like uh, browser extensions that will go into Twitch, but I'm sure, you know, like with the data set that Sora data have and you know, how good they are at building products. We already know if anyone at Sora day is listening, let's get the, uh, the streaming overlay logged into my so rare link it up to my uh account and uh, i can bang it on on sunday night and we can watch my goals come in from Turkey as and when they happen and we can have a party on on the stream might be good fun i could even dj while it's going off like we could really really start to mix and mash the worlds of uh of entertainment right here on twitch via end product but uh yeah i think uh be interesting to see if if so rare do start tapping into that into that uh gamblers market if they can do it is the big if i guess is it time are we able to do that yet without getting anyone worried uh upsetting any of our investors only so we will know that of course but i definitely feel like if there's a way that should be where we're looking maybe it's you know like the tipster accounts i know we have a few of those already um free tip scout i think is in the chat and we've got like the football economist is a player we've got quite a few of those kind of the tipster accounts on on twitter involved in the game um but yeah i guess it's uh you know can we be spoken of in the same breath as like the way you're listening to talk sport and bet 365 or paddy power pops up at half time with the current odds and you know can can we get can so get in there they're like oh you know like turkey's on a 55 you know, he's pushing for the U23 managers. There's a couple of people at the top now. You can pick Chucky up for this price. We expect him to score this, that, and the other next week. Like, I don't know. How, what has, I think, what hasn't I, been I think, I think one of the big things we could see, or uh, 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 not could, but um, in terms of it for kind of getting into that next kind of level you're talking about is when, like, <clears throat> you've got it. So, 
for, for me, when it comes to football, what does everyone want to see? Everyone wants to see the players. Everyone wants to hear from the players, whether it be the match or after the match and all the rest of it. And even when you look at guys like Alfonso Davies, what they do on social media, and you know, I know there's a lot of South Americans, I know Neymar's on Twitch all the time, and Aguero loves it, and Tevez and all these guys. But when you've got, like, I think players playing it, you know, we hear all the time about Premier League players making banter about FPL stuff, you know, yeah. like they play it, and they've got, you know, so I think that's uh, because I, I agree with the sentiment of the gambling market is as a market is worth a lot. And if you can get a piece of a big market share, then that's, you know, that's just a good business strategy in general. I get that. But I think Soria is really like blazing this trail of something that is really different and is really um, like, I've always been interested in fantasy football and never played it until this, yeah. you know, and I've always been interested in betting, knowing it's probably not, ultimately my best interest to do it as a full-time hobby mm. but do enjoy the bits of it i did enjoy like pouring 12 hours a day into computer games and all the rest of it blah 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 but and again like, like i said whenever i get uh, i'll stop you on this stuff before but because it is like i think anyone that will get the game i think the thing that you're waiting for is the light bulb moment of oh finally somebody's made this thing that yeah. hasn't ever before existed and is now here you know so it's not, I, I agree, like people that are already spending recreational money on football via betting are probably a shooting fish in a barrel in terms of a demographic, you know. Um, but there, there's plenty of people out there that spend recreational money on other stuff or, and football stuff as well that it's just about, it really is that understanding it. And when I've heard other people talk about this stuff before, they talk about how it's quite a hard thing to put across in an advert what, what yeah. it's all about it's a really hard thing to even put across in the name the name tells you nothing the advertisements the pitch side stuff tells you very little and getting everything that is so rare over to people is the hardest part of it you know because it's so so new and so widely encompassing and everything you know so i think the only way you get around that i think is by having it's, it's, it's just one of these things where time is part of it where it just needs to be around long enough for it to just kind of soak into the the zeitgeist as it were and people are like thoroughly more and more aware of it and all that thing and all this and all that and we've spoke about it before everyone's speaking about it now particularly the way next tweeting at the moment but the fiat wallet thing is going to be a real watershed yeah. that's going to be the last like that's going to be the last of the the crypto dark ages you know and then that will be a fully like a web three thing i think for me you know where it's like it's just like everything you know before but better you know. I think that's the future of all web free applications, not just so rare. I've always said it. I think the technology is too good to not be used for like everything that we do in a normal life. It, this should be how we bank. This should be how we book things. This should be how we like verify ownership of a house, verify ownership of anything. You know, your passport should be stored on chain, like all sorts of stuff. We should be this technology makes too much sense to not be used on a day to day basis. You know, the way that we collect Tesco club card points and avios or whatever it is all yeah. of that stuff is no different to like earning tokens on the blockchain doing interactions with things or like you know like maintaining the blockchain by like leaving your computer on overnight whatever there's so much value to be had in the kind of technology side of it but what we definitely don't need is people necessarily knowing that they're using it because there is this stigma attached to oh it's crypto it's a scam like it you know crypto is as much a scam as you know, post or mail is a scam. You can get scammed from a letter that lands in your in your house. That doesn't mean that Royal Mail is a scam. It's the same with crypto. It's like, yeah, there are scams out there, but the technology is not a scam. It, it works. It's just, you know, if we can move away from it, a lot of these apps will be built on Web3 technology moving forward. They don't necessarily need to shout about it. Whereas up to this point, everything was, hey, it's Web3, like invest loads of money in it because it's the next big thing. And it's like, I think we're getting beyond that stage of like, here's Web3. Wow. It's like we all kind of know what it is now. Uh, if you really know what it is, you might be less worried about it being a scam. But if you don't, you might still be a little bit sceptical of it. And I think, like you said, Fiat Wallet and like meant the term Dark Ages as well. And I think that this is the beginning of like a trend that I think we'll see across all crypto things and then you know like the fact that we're not talking about it as crypto and it's like someone will be using it, their email or using something and be like what do you mean it's crypto and it's like mate it's built on web3 that thing you're using that's what crypto is and they'll be like oh i thought crypto was tokens and all like you know dog coins and it's like no it's technology yeah. it's like email it's like the internet it's just the next thing that all these apps will be built on top of to verify 
who owns what, what's what, how much things are worth, value, value of attention, all sorts of stuff, right? So, yeah, it's massive, and it's it was very early as well to see this. Like this puts so rare ahead of a lot of other apps. Definitely a lot of NFT products. Um, and a lot of games as well, like online, like Web3 games. This will be a big step, not just for so rare, but for a lot of Web3 applications. And I think, like you said, it is massive and it can't be underestimated how my, many hurdles that will allow them to like just clear moving forward. We won't have to talk about it necessarily as a crypto product anymore because it is. It's built on crypto, but you won't need crypto. You won't need to interact with any crypto to play the game, which... Yep you know, and interact with it and fund it and get your money out of it. And I think hopefully it all works ahead of schedule. And it looks, you know, like it looks like things have been flashing up on the website. So they're obviously beyond the testing phase of it. They're trying to sort of, you know, I feel like they leak some of them things on purpose. People always like, oh, how are you not doing this in a test environment? Are you telling me like a big multi-billion dollar company is not doing this in a test environment? I think they do that on purpose to get tongues wagging to get people talking about it on podcasts like we are now um so yeah big big things come in in that sense i was re- i was reminded as well Sish, when you were talking there i seen the the nike dot swoosh nft community thing that they're launching and uh the thread i seen was one that nick retweeted and it was talking about how um you, you can go and check it on nick's retweets from a day or two ago but it's from a i forget the name of the account but it's got a purple icon and they talk about the dot swish thing and everything Nike are doing with it. And it sounds pretty exciting, but a big part of what Nike's approach from it is, is they're not really holding it out as Web3 and NFTs and all that. They're just holding out as Nike community. This is mm. what the Nike community are doing. And this is what we're all about and yada, yada. And it's that kind of, I think we're at that point now where anyone who wanted to join the crypto revolution has joined and anyone who didn't thinks it was a scam. And now it's a point of, you just need to go forward with the revolution and let, people join the party eventually when it happens you know um don't need to tell them anymore this is on they've made their choice that they're not into it or they've been turned off by something else which is fine um but then for the things that will work in in this world you know the so rares the nike project or whatever it might be other things they'll just then become things and then it'll be like, like you say it'll be a penny drop moment for people where they'll be like oh that's how yes this is special or that's why that's different here or oh I mean, I, I remember the first time I heard about NFTs and I was just like, what? Does, why would anyone want to pay for a picture of something? I don't, it didn't make no sense to me at all until I realized why the technology was useful or what it might be useful for and why someone might want one of them. And obviously, so is different because the NFTs actually have a use for something, whereas a lot of other things are like, what do you mean? And it's an expensive profile picture or, yeah, like, great, I can print it on a T-shirt legally, but then what like people don't understand or have a need for a lot of the use cases for nfts that's the problem i think why would anyone pay 50 grand for an eight picture you wouldn't unless you knew that or you had plans to do something with it right beyond just have it in a collection or you know you treat it as art and you see that as like the next banksy or something like that in 20 years like oh you know we'll look we'll look back on these nfts like we did at the early banksies and stuff like that right Obviously, there's a lot of poor art out there in the NFT space, but there's poor art in the real art world as well. Like if my son paints a picture, I don't think I could sell that for 10K. Do you know what I mean? But maybe one day, who knows? But um, but yeah, I think um, it is a minefield, isn't it? And like you said, I think uh, people are will, the penny will drop for some people, but I think that it will drop a lot easier on a product like SoRare than it will on maybe even on the Nike swoosh. A lot of people won't realize what or why you join some kind of nike community or club what like the, i think the way they hold it out is just like yeah early access to new drops of stuff and part you know i think they're just kind of holding it out as a as a members club kind of thing or a community kind of aspect thing i think um, that's the thing the closest thing to it at the moment is like being on a newsletter on a website on an email thing right but then you you can't kind of like turn up to an event like by showing your email address at at the door you know the, the, there's too many it's too easy too easy to do <laughs> You need to kind of like, I think that allows you a little bit more of an exclusivity. Like, you know exactly how many members there are, you know, like what the kind of value of that membership is based on like how the community values it. It's it's, it's just a different layer on top of like how we've seen fan clubs and stuff like that up to this point. 
Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how it kind of infiltrates like general culture. Um, but yeah, interesting now because I think we kind of come out the tail end of like the the crypto winter and the NFT boom. This is it now. It's like now it's it's not about like the but it's not a buzzword anymore. It's about like what utility like show people what they're used for now people kind of have heard the the noise like let's let them use them and see like what value they put on them after that yeah for yeah sure. i think we've covered a lot just in the time there we've been ticking over there but uh have, is there anything we forgot quinny is there anything we haven't covered um I've, I, no i think we did quite well um i was just willing to catch up in the comments there and i think everyone yeah i think we're pretty much all on the same page with a lot of the stuff. It's a big weekend coming up. It's probably the, the best place to, to, to leave it lying. Stishy boy, I'll be hoping uh, that Ange gets his finger out and picks the best team against St Mirren <laughs> uh, since he decided to rotate against them in the derby last week, which um, oh, was, did not pay off. Thought, no, it was it was brutally horrible. So I'm hoping for our cement product on the pitch and on the leaderboard um, again this week with the, with the hoops. So yeah, wish me luck on that one, mate. Where are you going to be swinging your your hook this week? Uh, <laughs> swinging my hoop. <laughs> I said hook. I said hook. I was thinking of it. Nah, I that was a horrific know. image in my head there. But uh, so my, I'm just having a little look at my lineup builder. I was like in there last night and this morning, just kind of piecing together. And I, th I think that my main entry is going to be in U23 Rare Pro. This weekend, as things stand, uh, an all-star rare pro is looking pretty strong as well. So, um, yeah, I've, I'm, at the moment, I'm lined up with uh, Yvonne the Youth um, at home. I think they play Amiens or something like that. They've got, uh, oh no, they've got a. Uh, is that Angers? I don't know. They've got a good fixture at home. Um, I've got another home fixture um, again against uh, Circle Bruges after they absolutely wiped the floor with them last weekend. Hopefully, do the same again. So I've got Piet Kowski, uh, centre-back, put up a huge score, 100 last weekend. So something close to that, even an 80-plus would be lovely. Uh, Veerman, uh, at home to Herenveen. PSV, looking pretty good at the moment. He's got that full 30% bonus there locked in now as a super rare. Nice. Uh, Mbappe, captain. Um, a big fixture for them. Uh, away from home, but with a huge, obviously, it's PSG. We're expecting them to smash. And then I've got... a. Uh, Serge Philippe Royal away uh, for Rodez. Uh, he has been putting up some great scores as a centre back for them. Uh, so I've got his super A lined up. So triple A scores almost all around in that team. Uh, two AAs, but I, owe, I, 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 in my heart of hearts, I think they're triple A fixtures as well. So very excited about that one. Got Romulo captain in the All Star Rare Pro team again. Hoping for another big performance from a. Uh, from Chengdu, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I feel good about the teams I've got out. Managed to get uh, the super rare threshold in last week, so got a bit of a hunger for that at the moment. Been going heavy into the super rare threshold this weekend, hoping to bring home the bacon again. But uh, yeah, very excited for the game week. Uh, good luck to you and to Celtic. And gutted, I'm going to be missing the game, uh, but fingers crossed. It's full on party mode for you and the gang there. Uh, bit of end products on and off the field with a bit of luck, mate. So, so. here we go. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, good luck to everyone in the chat and everyone who's listening on the podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment, all of that good stuff, as Quinny likes to put it. Uh, and we'll be back again next week with another episode. I'm very excited, hopefully, to be talking about how good our game weeks went. Indeed. Good luck, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Cheers, all. Let's get it.